Welcome back, everyone. In this video, I'll begin the lecture for related rates. Now, related rates in general, related rates just refers to studying rates of change, so the derivative of pretty much physical quantities. So things you can draw, or shapes, pretty much anything like that. But we want to see how they change specifically over time. So when we're talking about related rates, we're not just talking about a derivative. We saw in the last section with exponential growth and decay that most of those formulas were related to time. It came from a derivative, so really it was a type of related rate. But in this section, we're going to have just things over time, and we're not going to deal with any exponential functions because that's what the entirety of last section was about. In this section, we'll deal with other types of things. Now, related rates is pretty general, but usually what's going to happen in a problem is you're going to be given some sort of shape or described a diagram to draw, and you're going to compute a derivative using the chain rule, implicit differentiation, and solve for whatever we want to solve for. All right, so I have sort of an example described here just to really talk about what's going on. And what I have first here, it says, Suppose you are pouring sand into a pile and the pan and the pile makes the shape of a cone. So what I mean is imagine you're pouring sand into a pile and you know it wouldn't be perfect, but that pile basically makes the shape of a cone. You have something pouring the sand in. And as it spreads out, you've probably made piles before they spread out. They don't go completely on the ground, but they make sort of a shape that we could guess is like a cone. Now, the question you might be asked, you would be given more information, but you might be asked, what is the rate of change of the radius when the height of the cone is four feet? Once again, I'm not talking about solving this problem specifically, but basically a cone, there's the volume of a cone, which is probably what we'd want to use here, is one third pi r squared h. R is the radius of the circle on the base, and then the height is h. So from the top to the bottom, the height of the pile. And what it's asking is, as we keep pouring the sand on, what is the rate of change of the radius when the height of the cone is four feet? So if h was four, how would r be changing? Well, because we're interested in how things are moving over time, we would want to figure out dr over dt where t is representing the time. The main thing is that you'll notice in our volume equation for a cone, there is no t. Well, how do we make a dr over dt appear? We would have to do d over dt of each side. And this is really the idea of where implicit differentiation and chain rule and everything comes into play. So we would do d over dt of each side. And let me just fill it out just very literally doing what I said, doing d over dt of each side. The left side, well, we talked about the chain rule a lot. Maybe it's been a while since you thought about it, but t does not match v. So when we do d over dt of v, we just get dv over dt. And on the right side here, the one third pi is just a number. We can bring that out. And what we're left inside is r squared times h. Now this is kind of going to be a would be a tricky example and this is harder than an example when we'll start out but as you pour more in sand on you can imagine that the base is getting smaller or bigger so the radius is growing but the height's also growing which means r and h are both changing related to time so when you do the derivative of r squared times h you would need the product rule and we would get the derivative of the first, the derivative of r squared times the second, put this in parentheses, times h, the second, plus the first r squared times the derivative of the second h. All right, once again, you don't really have to completely understand 100% what I'm doing here. I'm just talking about, really, we're starting with a formula without t. But since we're un trying to understand what's changing over time, we have to do the derivative with respect to t. And basically, the point is going to be in every spot you're doing the chain rule. If we did the chain rule over here, 
we just had dv over dt. On the right, we have our one third pi out front. When we do the derivative of r squared with respect to d, well, those are different letters. So we get two r, but then that's times dr over dt because the derivative of r, the inside, is just that. Well, then that's multiplied by the h because that's just what's right here plus r squared and then the derivative with respect to t of h since it's just a single power it's dh over dt but that's it now when we do the problems what we'd have to be do be given is described a lot of stuff here so in the very basic example i didn't give you nearly enough information because i only gave you the height of the cone which is h so you could plug in four here but if you wanted to solve for dr over dt, you would need r, you would need, oh, well, like we said again, r, you would need dh over dt, so that's the rate at which the height is changing, and you would also need dv over dt. But the idea is going to follow like this in all these problems. You're going to be given either a shape or you're going to have to draw a diagram to represent it, and you're just going to have to figure out what equations to use do the derivative with respect to t of both sides, make sure you remember to do the chain rule. And once you get to here, you'll be able to plug in everything except what you're solving for. Now with that said, we're gonna go ahead and start with a couple of what I would call the easier examples. And the reason these are gonna be easier examples is because they're pretty much direct as long as you know the formulas. Right, the first one here, it says the length of a rectangle is increasing at a rate of four centimeters per second, and its width is increasing at a rate of eight centimeters per second. When the length is seven centimeters and width is five centimeters, how fast is the area of the rectangle increasing? Now, I didn't want to actually underline it. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that either. I didn't want to underline or highlight anything yet because we don't really know what we're doing until the end. The end tells us we want to find the area of the rectangle's rate of change because it's saying increasing. It says, how fast is the area of the rectangle increasing? Well, regardless of shape here, we want the area's rate of change. That means we want dA over dt. This is what we want. Right? The derivative is the rate of change and we're talking about area. Now, when it comes to the area of a rectangle, specifically the area of a rectangle is length times width. It doesn't matter when it comes to rectangles, which side you call length and which side you call width. It's just length times width. But when we plug that in for area, that means we're going to do d dt of length times width. And because the length and the width would be changing, if the area is changing, imagine if this is growing or shrinking. That means when we do the chain rule here, we're going to, and the derivative, we're going to have to use the product rule because we have a multiplication here. We do the derivative of the first, that would be dl over dt times the second, which is w, plus the first, which is l, times the derivative of the second, which is dw over dt. And now the thing that is when you read this problem, it might seem like you're given a lot of information. You're just given absolutely everything you need to know to use this formula. So the first thing is the length of the rectangle is increasing at a rate of four centimeters per second. What is that? That's dl over dt, and it's four. We'll make a note of here that it is centimeters per second, but it is the number four. And we're told the width is increasing at a rate of eight centimeters per second. So dw over dt is eight. And if we want to write the unit centimeters per second. So what we can do, well, just identify here, this is going to be eight, so dw over dt. The dl over dt is going to be four. And the other two pieces are just w and l. That's the width and the length themselves. And it says when the length is seven centimeters, so we want l to be seven, and the width is five centimeters, we want w to be five, then we're gonna figure out exactly what we have here. We want to figure out this formula. Well, the width we want to be five and the length we want to be seven. Now, once we've identified all that, then we can just plug it in. So this is four times five plus seven times eight, and this is 20 
and 56. 20 plus 56 is 76. Now, what are your units here? We're talking about how area is changing. Since our, our length unit is centimeters, it would be centimeters squared for area per second. The, the time unit we have is seconds. But that's it. Now, once again, this is kind of a simple example, but it's also an important example. It really wasn't a lot different than the one above. You know, our formula was a little easier. L times W is easier to write down than that formula. But otherwise, if you're given all the information you need, doing being able to do this one means you could also do the one above. All right now, moving on to number two, even though it's going to be a more complicated shape, it's not going to be a more challenging problem because once we know the setup, we'll be fine. So this one says a cylindrical tape, tank, not tape, and that's telling us that we're being involved with a cylinder with a radius of three meters. So we're told the radius of the cylinder is three meters is being filled with water at a rate of four meters cubed per minute. And the question is, how fast is the height of the water increasing? How fast is the height of the water increasing? All right, so this one seems you know, a little more complicated, like I said, because we are talking about a cylinder. Now, one thing you want to notice here is that this part, the rate, not so much the rate, the fact that they're giving you the rate in words, but what they're giving you here is telling you what to use about a cylinder. We want to use its volume. And the reason we want to use the volume is volume deals with cubic units. Area deals with squared units, so if this was 4 meters squared, then we'd probably be talking about the surface area of the cylinder. But usually, we like to deal with volume, and that's exactly what we're doing here. And it makes sense because it's being filled with water. If you're filling a cylindrical tape tank, I don't know why I want to keep saying tape. If you're filling a cylindrical tank here with water, we're not just filling the sides of it up, we're filling the entire thing. So that's really you know, the volume right here, okay? All right, now, what is the volume of a cylinder? Well, if you don't know any of these formulas, just go ahead and look them up. There's nothing wrong with that. These aren't, so, this isn't something that I expect people to have memorized. The volume of a cylinder is pi r squared h. Uh, one thing I like to remember that helps me is I actually I do have this one memorized. The only reason I have the cone formula memorized for volume is it's one third times this. So just as a little helpful way to remember how to memorize that. Uh, but as far as the cylinder goes, h is the height, so it's the height of the cylinder, and then the radius is the radius of the circle. Now, before we go ahead and just plug in stuff, one thing I want to point out is that what's happening as we fill the water? Well, as we increase the amount of water, the volume goes up, of course, because we're very literally putting more water, water in it. So the volume of water increases. The height also increases. But one thing to note here is that the radius of a cylinder never changes. Right? It doesn't matter if the water is filled up to here, if it's filled all the way up to the top, the radius of the cylinder is the same. What does that mean? That means dr over dt equals zero because the radius is not changing. Now that was not the case when I did that pre-example about the cone because the cone does change radius at the bottom with that example we did. But this one, the radius doesn't change. That means dr over dt equals zero. And if you don't point that out, it's going to be impossible to do this. But once again, outside of that little side note that I wanted to take care of first, I want to go ahead and now start the same way that we described. Just do the derivative with respect to t of both sides. And now I'm going to actually go through and pretend for the moment that the R is changing because I want you to see what happens when it's not really changing. And then if we ever point out that something's derivative is zero 
in the future, then we know it's basically just a number. Um, but ultimately what's going to happen is because the derivative of r with respect to t is zero is we can actually factor out the entire pi r squared because it's a constant. But for the moment, I want to pretend that it's not just so you can see it the way it works. So we got to use the product rule here. We have pi r squared as our first and then h as our second. You could bring the pi out if you want, but I'm just going to leave it on there for the simplicity of it. The left side is just dv over dt. And the right side, when we do the derivative of the first, we do the derivative of pi r squared with respect to t. Well, the derivative of that would be pi. Well, actually, I can just bring the two down from the power rule. So I'm actually make it easier on myself and bring it in front. Two pi r, subtract one from the power, and then multiply by dr over dt from the chain rule. All right, so same chain rule we've been doing the whole time. R doesn't match t, so we do the power rule bring the two down, but I just brought it in front of the pi and then multiplied by dr over dt, multiplied by the second h plus the first, which is pi r squared times the second, the derivative of the second. So d over dt of h, which is just dh over dt. But the point here is that because dr over dt is zero, this, since this equals zero, this entire thing is zero, right? It doesn't matter what R is. It doesn't matter what H is. We're multiplying it by zero, so it's zero. And if you'll just notice what happened here is when we get our final formula, dV over dt equals, this is all gone. We have pi R squared and then dH over dt. You'll notice that it's exactly what I described. If I had pretend that the r squared was a constant, which it is because the derivative is not changing, then I'm only doing the derivative with h. r is just sticking around, or r squared. Now, if you're just not confident in that idea yet, of course, go ahead, do the full thing out. There's nothing wrong with that. It wasn't that much work, but I wanted to go ahead and point that out. Now that we have this formula, we can hopefully solve for what we want. So what are we being told and what do we want to find out? Well, we're, be, we told, we're told the radius is three meters, so R equals three. We were told the rate of change of the volume, which is dV over dt, and that's four meter cubes per minute. And we wanted to know how fast is the height of the water increasing. So what is dH over dt? Well, if you look down on our formula, we have three variables and it's exactly those three things dv over dt is 4, pi equals pi, r is 3 squared, and then the one we're solving for, dh over dt. All right, let's go ahead and solve for this. Uh, one thing I guess I can just kind of do it quickly is 3 squared is 9, so this is 9 pi. If you divide each side by 9 pi, this will all go away, and you have 4 over 9 pi equals dh over dt. And the units here, if you want them, since height is in meters, because that's the R length unit, this would be meters per minute. But that's it. And you'll notice in this one, we weren't told to round by any measure, which means you just want to leave it like this. The answer is going to be 4 over 9 pi. All right, for these two examples, are really supposed to be just kind of preliminary. Yes, we it did help to draw a picture, especially in the second one, to really understand that dr over dt is zero. But ultimately, we probably could have just not drawn the picture, had the formula, done everything out, and it would work the same way. What you'll notice with the rest of the problems in this section is that if you don't draw a picture, you're going to have a very, very challenging time doing it. But I'll see you in the next video.